So, ladies and gentlemen, so excited for today. We've got the legendary Dr. Michael Greger in the house. Michael, it's such a pleasure connecting. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> so, let's kick this off on a positive note. I'm from the UK. Um, the second biggest killer here is dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, what can we do to counteract this absolutely vicious and horrifying disease yeah i'm um, here in the states we have four million americans affected uh and uh, yeah it's increasingly leading killer well we know that those uh, from the first adventist study that those that uh um, don't eat meat um i have about half the risk of getting dementia later in life i um, mean those that don't eat meat for extended periods of time um, uh, have about three times lower risk. Now, that's not just Alzheimer's, that's for all types of dementia, including vascular dementia. But uh, that's probably the most important thing we can do to protect our long-term cognitive function is by keeping our cerebral arteries open. So the atherosclerotic pla uh, plaque that can squeeze off blood flow to the heart and cause a heart attack um, can also squeeze off blood flow to the brain and cause a stroke. But just like um, uh, even before the heart attack, you can impair your heart's ability to function. You can get angina, that chest pain. Even before a stroke, the lack of blood flow to the memory centers of the brain are correlated with increased risk of developing and progressing um, with Alzheimer's disease. So it's critically important to, uh, to uh, provide proper nutrition uh, to the brain tissue. That's oxygen, nutrients, and you pull away waste products. It's only possible when uh, the arteries within your brain are not um, uh, are not encased in atherosclerotic plaque. Mm, so interesting. So I'll come back to the meat part. But for now, one question which I was asked um, before this started on Instagram, it was that if you have three levers which we can pull for nutrition, lever A would be um, dietary restrictions, so, you know, avoiding trans fat, certain food groups you mentioned, meat. Lever B uh, would be caloric restrictions, things like not becoming overweight, you know, limiting to, say, 2,000 calories a day or so. And then lever C, let's imagine that that would be um, time-restricted eating, so intermittent fasting. So I've spoken to a few people that seem to have different takes on which one would yield the highest ROI. Where does Dr. Michael Greger stand on which one of those three levers would? Oh, well, I mean, if you look at the Global Burden of Disease Study, the largest study of disease risk factors in history funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, not only is the leading cause of death on planet Earth our poor diet, but what about our diet is the worst? Well, if you go down the list... Um, you say, well, what could be, what's the worst things about humanity diet? Soda, processed meat, trans fat? No. Number one is uh, too much sodium. Um, uh, and then uh, the next is uh, uh, inadequate fruit consumption, inadequate vegetable consumption, inadequate nut and seed consumption, and inadequate uh, um, uh, whole grain consumption. Um, so those are the top five. And so four out of the five are not things we're getting too much of, but actually things we're not getting enough of because these whole plant foods are so powerfully protective that inadequate intake um, leads to uh, such uh, so much uh, disease and death. And so um, it's really not what you're restricting so much as, as, as for the most part, what you're getting more, uh, too much of, um, with the exception certainly of sodium. Mm. And in terms of um, getting enough of the right stuff, you have a very, very renowned challenge, Dr. Gregor's Daily Dozen, which uh, I I'm read. I'm doing one right now, Hibiscus Dean. <laughs> I love it, man. So I wonder, could you talk our audience through, you know, the sort of principles and what types of things we should be included in this legendary challenge? Yeah, so, uh, so in my book, How Not to Die, it's split up in two sections. The first half is just 15 chapters on each of the 15 leading causes of death, talking about the role diet may play in preventing, arresting, or reversing each of our top 15 killers. But I didn't want it to just be kind of a reference book. I wanted it to be a practical guide on making, you know, a daily grocery store type decisions 
Um, and so that's what, where I center my recommendations around a daily dozen checklist of all the healthiest of healthy foods I encourage people to try to fit into their daily routine. So, for example, greens every day, the healthiest vegetable, berries every day, the healthiest fruits, legumes, your beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils, a tablespoon of uh, ground flax seeds, uh, a quarter teaspoon of turmeric, the best beverages, the best, uh, you know, how much exercise to get, the best sweeteners. Um, again, just trying to inspire people to include some of these um, uh, healthiest of healthy foods. And so I have a, a free app on iPhone, Android, Dr. Greger's Daily Dozen. You can just check through the list and see if you uh, get all your servings for the day. Um, and uh, and so, uh, you know, so uh, I'm on a treadmill as we speak, drinking a biscuit tea. I'm already doing okay. <laughs> Man, I love it. So in terms of, um, you know, this sort of essence when I read How Not to Die, I got the impression that you were a, a massive advocate of, you know, the things you talked about there. Um, it was, you know, pretty much as much vegetables you could stuff your face full of. It was whole foods, uh, a diet rich in um, plant-based foods, beans, uh, fruits, nuts, etc. Um, so just in terms of that, is the essence not so much that those are the things we're consuming but also i suppose when you do that you're also cutting out the other stuff like those trans fats and whatnot sure yeah yeah so there's this dual benefit right uh, food is kind of a zero-sum game so every time every time we put something in our mouth it's a lost opportunity to put something even healthier in our mouth so it's all about trying to you know notch up so even just within a plant-based diet and there's plants and there's plants. So blueberries are healthier than bananas. They're both fruit. They're both healthy. But we can always kind of notch it. You know, but it, there's, you know, if you're going to put some kind of fruit on your oatmeal, you know, you have a choice. And one choice is healthier than the other choice. Now, the other choice isn't unhealthy. Um, but, you know, we can all try to kind of, you know, notch up our game. It's, that's what it's really all about. And so there's this dual benefit. Anytime you eat something healthy, yeah, we get all the, the benefits. But then we're also not getting the detriments of something that we might otherwise be putting in our mouth. And the same in the reverse. So we eat something crappy. So we eat a donut for breakfast or something. Not only are we getting um, all the trans or saturated fat and added sugar and all that, you know, refined grain garbage, but you know, we just lost an opportunity to get some fiber, to get, you know, to eat uh, some porridge or something and actually get something healthy. Um, in our body and so uh yeah so that's a good way to think about it mm, very interesting so you mentioned that it's you know the the zero sum game of sorts so if i was to sort of put you on the spot and say you know of your daily dozen if you could you know sort of give me maybe three wonderful recommendations that should be staples in everyone's diet what what would you go for well if there were just three things to add to someone's diet um, it would be legumes, which would be beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils, greens, and berries. Those would probably be the top three. And if there were just three things to first remove from one's diet, um, it would be trans fat, um, uh, processed meat, bacon, ham, hot dogs, lunch meat, uh, which are known to be carcinogenic. And then a third would be uh, soda. So, you know, sh sugar water. That's, uh, that's uh, yeah, those would be the top three things that I'd first remove from one's diet. Fantastic. Thank you for that. I recently did an interview with uh, Dr. Neil Barnard. Um, ah, uh -huh. Great guy. You know, it was a phenomenal interview. Um, I noticed in the interview that uh, Dr. Barnard, he's an advocate of a very low fat diet. Um, I did another interview with uh, Dr. David Perlmutter. He's a neurologist. He was a big advocate of uh, olive oil. So I wonder in terms of um, this... Where do you stand on this matter of uh, oil? Oh, I'd like to see people eat whole food sources of macronutrients. And so I mean, oil is kind of like the table sugar of the fat kingdom, right? So you take something like a sugar beet, which is where most sugar comes from. Um, it's a really healthy food, but then you remove all the nutrition, you're left with just the sugar, right? Same thing with oil. You take something like a walnut, remove all the nutrition, left just with walnut oil. Now there's some vitamin E and a few fat-soluble nutrients, but basically you've just robbed all the fiber, take all the minerals, you've removed most of the nutrition. And so you're basically left with just pure calories, either pure sugar calories, pure fat calories, or pure protein calories. If you're just eating like protein powders as opposed to whole foods. Um, and so you're really robbing yourself. Yeah, you're getting that specific macronutrient, 
But I mean, that's not. I mean, we we have you know the need for um, uh, for much more than just a bare minimum. And so I encourage people to get uh, their macronutrients, um, their carbs, their protein, their fat from whole food sources. And the healthiest whole food sources are the plant sources. Mm. Let me uh, bring back uh, the meat argument. What do we know from the data about the cause, the links between, say, meat consumption and uh, potential mortality? Oh well, um, just uh, ten days ago, June, July thirteenth, um, uh, in uh, in uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association, the Internal Medicine Journal, Wong et al. published. Um, in uh, the uh, NIH AARP study, this is the largest prospective study on diet and health in human history, with over 400,000 men and women here in the states, showing that we're placing, you know, three percent of calories from uh, of animal protein with plant protein um, could significantly extend lifespan, so significantly decrease um, overall mortality. Just three percent of calories, and so this was with um, animal protein in general, the worst was egg protein. So if you swap out eggs for plants, that's the best, um, uh, um, you know, in terms of uh, how detrimental animal protein was. But, you know, this goes back to 2016 with the, um, the famous uh, twin Harvard cohorts, the Harvard Nurses Study and the Health Professionals Study, over 100,000 men and women. Again, 3% of uh, calories from um, plant protein swap for animal protein, any animal protein. So plant protein beat out not just red meat, processed meat, but chicken, beat out fish, eggs, dairy protein, any single one of them, making a swap for plant protein for any of the animal protein significantly decreased um, overall mortality, meaning decreased risk of premature death. Mm. That is so, so interesting to me. So I suppose the question then comes, um, you know, is there a sort of upper bound or even a lower bound, how much meat we could actually get away with. Oh, well, you know, it doesn't matter what you eat on your birthdays or holidays, special occasions. It's the day-to-day -day stuff that really adds up. Um, uh, probably the uh, closest in terms of what the upper bound is was a study um, that it was actually in the introduction to How Not to Die. I believe it was in Taiwan where they looked at these, um, these Zen Buddhist um, communities um, which were nice because people lived there for decades and they had total control over the diet, like they had zero junk food, no soda. Um, but um, one just happened to be, um, uh, um, you know, strictly plant-based. The other one had uh, just, for whatever reason, they had um, a very low meat intake. If I remember, it was like one serving every three days or something. Um, so a single serving every three days. And so they had these two communities, very similar kind of homogeneous, very similar kind of, uh, you know, activity patterns, weren't eating junk, very stable diets for decades. And so this is like a, a really nice natural experiment that was set up um, to see, well, I mean, are we going to see, you know, noticeable differences in health if plant-based most of the time, but just every couple of days have a survey of meat? Um, and what they found was a dramatic increase in diabetes rates among those who had uh, um, uh, just uh, you know one two servings a week of meat, which is really quite surprising. If you would have asked me to predict um, what they would find from that study, I would be skeptical that they'd really be able to tease out differences. It's like someone who doesn't smoke at all and someone who smokes a few cigarettes. Like, is it really going to make that much of a difference? But it really did, and that was really surprising to me. So it would be less than once every few days. Now, can you get away with once a week, once every two weeks? Those studies haven't been done. We're not, uh, we're not sure. But uh, certainly, it's not all or nothing. It's the more we can cut down and replace it with healthy whole plant foods, the better. Mm. And would that be both, would that the whole food plant-based diet, is that the ultimate diet for longevity? Uh, we will find out. That's my next book, How Not to Age, be on December 2022. I'm going to spend the next year of my life um, doing the research, um, and so uh, we will uh, TBD. <laughs> we will find out. In terms of, um, I want to, I want to get onto your latest book, which is out. But let me um, loop back in because as we're talking about, um, you know, making better nutrition choices, I love that zero sum game which you talked about. I want to know 
uh, if we're sort of zo- uh, coming out of specific nutrition choices, and let's go into more of a psychology and behavioral design point of view, what have you noticed in terms of how people can actually introduce these day to day and break the cycle of bad nutrition choices? Oh, it's just control over your environment. Like, look, I mean, I don't care what your willpower is. If you surround yourself with junk food, you're going to get hungry, you're going to eat junk food. I mean, these foods were designed to hook into our evolutionary triggers for cell sugar and fat. I mean, they were just designed to uh, um, to overcome our, uh, you know, our better judgment. And so you just have to surround yourself with other foods. So you come to my house, there's no, no salt shaker, no junk in the house, right? And so if I get hungry enough, I'm going to eat an apple. Do I, would I rather have some Doritos than an apple? Damn right I'd rather have Doritos rather than But there ain't no Doritos. And yeah, I could go to the store, get some Doritos, but I'm busy, right? I mean, it's just adding a few more barriers, a few more steps. You know, but if you're like, you put, the, you put a big bowl of candy on your desk, you just kind of munch on candy all day, right? Um, and I mean, that's just, and so it's just, and so we should give up this idea that, you know, if we just kind of white knuckle through it, we can, you know, I mean, the, these are designed by, by they're, they're, what they're called taste engineers. Literally, they just sit around all day and try to find out how best to, uh, to, to get your money. Um, and the fact that it's also contributing to some of the leading killers and destroying the lives of millions of people, well, you know, they, you know it's like the tobacco industry. They want to make money. So how do they make money? Oh, let's sell something that's addictive. That's a way to make money. And they did. And millions of people died. Um, But, you know, so what do you do with smokers? Um, Do you tell smokers, well, just don't smoke, but have a pack of cigarettes right in front of you? Do you tell alcoholics, don't drink? But yeah, but just, you know, have, you know, have five cold beers in front of you at all times. No, you say, just stay away from alcohol, right? You don't want it. You don't want even the sight of an ashtray to trigger that reminder. You gotta get it out of the house. Could you go to the liquor store? Could you go to the corner, buy some cigarettes? Yeah, you could, but just that little extra step, that little extra energy. We also have an energy conservation um, uh, evolutionary uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, heritage as well, where you know, our body wants to conserve energy. And you know, if even just a little inconvenience um, uh, will, you know, will, will help us. And so, yeah. So control over your environment. I mean, that's really now not everyone can do that. Like what if you have people in your household that are eating other foods, not supporting you? What if you go to workplace that's crappy, you know, have, you know, cupcake celebrations every day, you know, that's, 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 that, that is going to undermine your ability to take care of yourself. Yeah, man. I love that. Um, so right now, you know, as uh, everyone listening, you know, we'll know we are in the midst of a global pandemic. It's very unfortunate. We are hoping and praying for a, for a, for an effective vaccine. So if we look at our own locus of control, your latest book, How to Survive a Pandemic, is out. Was it last month? It came out or two months ago? Came out. No, came out last month, and then it will be on physical copies on August eighteenth. Wow, fantastic! So. Could you give us a preview of some nutritional choices that perhaps could fight off, say, respiratory uh, tract infections? Yeah, well, I mean, consider the underlying risk factors for COVID-19, disability, severity, and death. Obesity, heart disease, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, all of which can be prevented, arrested, and even reversed with a healthy enough plant-based diet and lifestyle. Right? Even excess body fat alone is a risk factor independent of diabetes. Um, so uh, having a BMI of 28, which is like, oh, well, let's say I, I'm gonna give you pounds. Let's see, what's uh, 175 LBS in kilograms? Let's see how many stone that is. Okay, so being 79 kilograms, the average um, height um, puts you at nearly six times the odds of a severe COVID-19 course. Now here in the States, the average BMI is, is, uh, is uh, 29. Um, and so even being skinnier than the average American puts you, has, you, has, you can have so much excess body fat that can put you um, at significantly higher risk. So that's why this is the time to take care of yourself. If you ever want to like start an exercise program or start, you know, think about cleaning up your diet, 
start a meditation program, stress reduction, better sleep hygiene. This is the time to really take advantage of this kind of reset moment and really set, put in place, you know, uh, lifelong habits that will protect you right now in the days and weeks ahead, but will also protect you in the decades ahead from chronic disease as well. Mm. So in terms of, do you have any specific food recommendations for fighting COVID-19? Oh, well, I mean, I talk about how uh, because the, you know, unlike other common viruses, coronaviruses have not been shown to uh, cause more severe disease in immunosuppressed patients because your own immune response appears to be the main driver of lung damage during infection. So, you know, there are these amazing studies showing simple foods can boost your immune function, like randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials, showing that, you know, broccoli sprouts, for example, can decrease uh, uh, um, virus-induced inflammation, reduce viral loads in influenza, um, boost our antiviral natural killer cell activity, but this is not the flu, right? I mean, co with COVID-19, starting around the second week of symptoms, uh, the virus can trigger what's called a cytokine storm, which is like a, uh, an autoimmune reaction where your body overreacts and then attacking the coronavirus, your lungs get caught in the crossfire and then kind of burning down the village in order to save it, you may not survive the process. So that's why, yes, I encourage people to have these general common sense um, uh, you know, uh, measures to improve their health, but we should not go out of our way to, eat, to take particular supplements or eat specific foods to boost different elements of our immune system until we really know more about this virus. Very interesting. So, you know, reading your books and speaking to you today, are you worried about the rise of, say, something like the carnivore diet? I mean, that's just it's silliness. Am I concerned? Well, I'm concerned for anyone who would do it. But, uh, I mean, I can't imagine that. I mean, it's like these, you know, these low-carb fads. That have been, uh, you know, we've been on and off, on or on and off since like 1850. You know, every decade or so, you know, they come raging back until they all fail miserably, and then people forget about it. And they come raging back again, and the reason is people want to hear good news about their bad habits. I mean, who doesn't want to be told bacon and butter is good for you? I mean, it's just like, wow, that's my kind of diet, right? But, um, uh, you know, I mean, it's. Uh, you know, uh, it's uh, the, the point of weight loss is not to fit into a skinnier casket. And we know that um, people that are uh, eating this way live significantly shorter lives. Um, and they're, they, you know, it's not worth kind of, uh, you know, mortgaging your health to lose weight. And you can have the best of both worlds. So that's what How Not to Diet is about. Actually, the single best diet proven for weight loss, meaning the diet that's been shown in the, in the peer-reviewed scientific literature to kick every other diet's butt that didn't restrict calories or enforce exercise. No other diet worked better, and guess what? It's the same diet that reverses heart disease, the same diet um, that's uh, the kind of the safest, cheapest, healthiest way to eat a whole food plant-based diet. I love it, man, I love it. Just as a general question, what would, if you could, uh, if you had the power, if you were playing a video game and you could do one thing to everybody in the world, either diet or lifestyle, what would your sort of uh, upgrade be that you would uh, impart? Uh, well, a uh, global burning disease study, reduced sodium intake. I would cut everyone's sodium intake to 1,500 milligrams or less. And you know what country is actually doing the best in the entire world about reducing salt? The UK. Oh, really? The UK did this amazing private-public partnership where they got together. So the reason why, let's say, let's say the CEO of Burger King wants not to kill people and says we're going to reduce the sodium in our what Big Macs, Whoppers, whatever they have, um, by 10%, right? Or we're in our French fries, we're gonna, in our chips, we're going to reduce it 10%. Well, guess what? People just go buy McDonald's, right? You can't do that because there's this competitive market. They salt it exactly to the bliss point, right? So any, you put too much, too little, you, you, people aren't going to like it as much, right? And so, uh, and so, so you put a competitive disadvantage. So what the British government did brilliantly is they got together all the companies, all the fast food chains, all the restaurants and said, okay, everybody's going to drop it 10%. Um, and so no one, and so then it's 11 plating field. And so we're going to drop it all down. Everybody's fries, everybody's burgers have to get, um, less sodium. And so everything tastes the same now. So no one has a competitive advantage. 
and it's one of the few countries that have been able to significantly drop sodium intakes and blood pressures have dropped and has so as disease end plan, disease endpoints like um, uh, like heart attacks and death, all because of this population wide benefit. And people don't even now look. People can you can pour you can take your salt shaker you can put all the salt you want on it. It's easier to add salt than it is to remove salt from a meal, right? And so this is so you know the the food the salt industry likes to say that you know you're impairing people's freedom. Big Brother is coming in and saying everyone's got to drop their salt intake. You can do whatever you want. You can always add salt, but what this is just saying is as a default, let's make things a little healthier. And on a population scale, we're saving a lot of lives. And so I actually have a video coming up talking about how you know we need to take the British government's example and start you know dropping sugar levels and soda and all sorts of other things. And that's how we can do it. We can do it. Um, by a, a society-wide scale. Wow. Go on, Boris. <laughs> so my last question to you, if we take this away from uh, nutrition, and there's been so much fantastic advice today, we always ask at the end of uh, every episode. So to you, Michael, what makes a life worth living? A life worth living is a life that's dedicated to the reduction of unnecessary suffering. That's why I get up every day, is to reduce suffering in the world. That's what I define as making the world a better place. I want to get up and go to bed every night knowing that there's a little bit of suffering I reduced in the world. The world's a little bit of a better place or a less worse place than it was when I woke up because of something specifically I did. That's the way I can look at myself in the mirror. That's how I can feel human every day. And uh, I don't understand how everyone else doesn't have the same re- the same. I mean, that's just like, what else is there undeniably good about reducing something that's undeniably bad as suffering? What a beautiful answer. Can you tell these guys listening where they can connect with you and if you've got any other messages for them? You can go to nutritionfacts.org as my contact info and all everything uh, I've done available for free. Um, and you know all the proceeds I received from all my books donated to charity, the new book, all my other books. And I uh, just want to leave people with the good news that we have tremendous power over our health, destiny, and longevity. The vast majority of premature death and disability is preventable with a plant-based diet and other healthy lifestyle behaviors. Keep up the good work. Good talking to you.